Thank you all uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Ada Tagar Cohen, a professor at the Graduate School of Theology uh, at, and the director of the Center for the Interdisciplinary uh, Study of the Monotheistic Religions uh, at Dosha University. Let me present the second CISMOR seminar for this academic year. Um, I'm honored to have Professor Dr. Samuel Follenweider of the Faculty of Theology at Zurich University as our guest today. Um, Professor Follenweider has actually just recently retired and as we can see, uh, he is continuing to write his research and he is introducing it to us. Uh, let me um, say a few words about uh, Professor Follenweider. Um, he received his PhD at the Faculty of Theology of Zurich University in 1983 and his habilitation in 1987. Earlier in 1980, he received his ordination for a uh, Verbi Divini Minister in Zurich. From 1989 until 2000, he was professor at Bern University in the Faculty of Theology, being also the Dean for a couple of years. And then in 2000, he moved to the University of Zurich until his retirement in 2019, uh, serving in the years 2006 to 2008 as the Dean of the Theological Faculty. Um, Professor Follenweider has published numerously and I will only mention his latest book that uh, came out in 2020. And um, I will show the book. So it's Antike und uh, Urchristentum Studien zur Neutestamentlichen Theologie in ihren Kontexten und Rezeptionen. And uh, we have it in the library, but uh, I apologize. I was not in the university to pick it up. So I'm showing it from uh, our library um, um, stacks. And uh, this is, I understand, um, a kind of a compilation of much of his work through the years. Professor Wollenweider has long connections with the Faculty of Theology at Dosha University. And while in 1988 to 1989, he taught at the faculty as a lecturer. And then in a visit uh, later on, he gave us also a series of lectures. I have invited Professor Follenweider to teach an intensive graduate course for a month at the Faculty of Theology in 2020, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it had to be canceled. I am therefore very glad that uh, Professor Follenweider accepted my invitation to give a special lecture online today in the framework of Sismore Seminar. The theme today is early Jewish and early Christian apocalypticism. Uh, the lecture will be for about an hour and after which we will have time for question and answers. So Professor Follenweider, I invite you, the platform is yours. So, thank you very much for your kind introduction, dear Ada, and welcome all here. Invisible for me, but <laughs> I am visible for you um, to this uh, seminar. It is here early in the morning. For you, it's um, afternoon. We had yesterday evening a sports event 
Euro um, football, and uh, we had a heavy match against Spain. And in the end, we lost, but it was really in the in the last penalty uh, action. And um, so people are happy that we have that we could stand against such a strong opponent like Spain. Um, well, this is what was yesterday. Now for today, our theme, I would like now to join with you my build share the screen um, and go. Yes. Is it okay now you see now it's a great honor to offer one of these year seminars and I especially thank again Ada for making this invitation possible. I have chosen my topic for two reasons. First, it is a preview of a course I hope to offer in Kyoto next year. Second, this is a particularly pertinent and burning topic. It's always the first line that uh, disappears. That's really bad. Yeah. On the one hand, there are many groups around the world that are expect, expecting the end of the world. On the other hand, one can argue about the general and global awareness of something like a crisis. We currently have a pandemic that is far from over, in Japan even more far from over than here in Europe. And that will also have long term consequences. Shortly before that, awareness has grown that the severe climate crisis is on the way. This topic has only temporarily stepped into the background and it will be soon in the foreground again. A few decades earlier, it was the Vietnam War that filled people with fear, especially in the United States. Apocalypse Now is a movie by Francis Coppola that has become a cult film. Apocalypse Now is an experience that goes with us and haunts every generation anew. In this seminar, I would like to content myself with a historical view. It is about apocalypticism in early Judaism and early Christianity. My paper has four parts. The first part is about determining and defining the historical phenomena. The second part offers a cultural theoretical model for understanding apocalypticism. The third part deals with early Jewish apocalypticism, whereas the fourth part treats early Christian apocalypticism. And you will see, as I started now, my whole text always on the screen. I think it's um, helpful within this format to hear and to see my text. There are very intense scholarly debates in the field of early Judaism and early Christianity, as well as in the field of cultural theories. Please note that due to the time constraints, I am unable to discuss all the research literature. So it's in the back, as you see my books in the back, but I have, uh, I don't want to discuss it uh, in um, each with each, uh, with all the th themes and colleagues and so on. But at least two uh, handbooks that are important for our theme, uh, 
two handbooks from Oxford and Cambridge, um, which are uh, very helpful and they offer a lot of material. So if you want to go deeper into this field, this would be the first steps. The one on the left hand side, edited by John Collins, we hear later about him, is from 2014. And the, um, hand, the Cambridge Companion is uh, really, it's, uh, it's new, it's of um, printed this year. First chapter, what do we mean with early Jewish and early Christian apocalypticism? Our historical field spans the time from the third century for Christ to the second century Christ's era. We have different groups in focus. Some of them expect a near end of the world. Others claim to look beyond the limits of earthly life to a world beyond. All refer to an insight of a hidden order behind or above our apparent reality. This insight is not acquired empirically or discursively, but through a revelation. That is why the terminology of disclosure is important. It stems from the Greek apocalyptein. The label apocalypticism is not ancient, but early modern. But it is based on the claim of these groups to know, to have a hidden knowledge. This knowledge is not simply theoretical or speculative, but it is what we call in German Orientierungswissen, a kind of world view. Such knowledge enables basic orientation in the world and thus behavior corresponding to it. In Judaism, groups of this kind have played an important role since at last the third century before Christ. This and the following centuries are a highly formative period. However, apocalypticism has been present in all subsequent periods since then. Since the nation Christianity emerged in the wake of the Judaism of the time, it shares with it, with it most of what we call apocalypticism. Here the first century is particularly formative, although apocalypticism also accompanies Christianity throughout the centuries. I was talking about groups. How do we know about them? Exclusively through texts they have left us. Apocalypticism as a historical and cultural phenomenon can therefore only be defined more closely by focusing on the corresponding texts that originated in early Judaism and early Christianity. I would like to offer a compact and adequate definition here. It comes from Yarbrough and John Collins, the Yale University couple, retired, who received an honorary doctorate from my university in Zurich a few years ago. Here is the definition. Apocalypse is a genre of revelation literature with a narrative framework 
in which a revelation is mediated by another worldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality, which is both temporal insofar as it in envisages eschatological salvation and spatial insofar as it involves another supernatural world. Such a work is intended to interpret present earthly circumstances in light of the supernatural world and of the future and to influence both the understanding and the behavior of the audience by means of divine authority. I emphasize the one point that apocalyptic literature is not only about end time expectations, but also about insight into afterlife and heavenly worlds. So it is about imaginations of time as well as of space. And I'm just noting here in passing, Jewish and Christian apocalyptic literature is a special case in the broad field of ancient revelatory literature. This type of literature was very common in the ancient Mediterranean world, for example, in Greek or Roman culture. Um, so we have here some special cases of a much uh, broader and larger phenomenon. Now, second part, testing an explanatory model cultural theoretical considerations. I will attempt to understand apocalypticism as a phenomenon of subcultures, that is of partial cultures under the umbrella of a global culture. In the Hellenistic period, the second half, the fourth century, or a global culture emerges determined by a common language and by certain cultural patterns in education and society. This kind of global cultures then continues in the Roman era. So this tries to uh, reformulate what uh, in classical uh, scholarship has been described as Hellenization of the Oriental world, starting with uh, the Alexander the Great and the establishing uh, Hellenistic monarchy. And then the, in the following centuries, the Hellenistic monarchies evolving and finally then trans, uh, transfer to the Roman world, which deepened and followed again what we call Hellenization. Hellenization. Subcultures participate in this global culture, but maintain their own norms and identity constructions. Subcultures in Hellenistic Roman society are most clearly to be grasped under an ethnic sign. This is the case with Judaism and its various forms. But it also includes religious communities such as the Christians. Then it is, is the focus on religion, belief system, not on the ethnic um, uh, dimension and profile. But it can also be described as a kind of a subculture. 
these subcultures share essential basic values with the majority culture, but follow different norms and standards at specific points. Under certain circumstances, a subculture can mutate into a counterculture. This is the case when a whole series of fundamental values and norms of the majority society are called into question. Their own norms and standards within these subcultures take the place. But at the same time, they continue. Also, so these subcultures or even countercultures cultures continue to share a very broad foundation of standards and values. The encounter of cultures can result in very different outcomes. The spectrum ranges from assimilation and absorption to integration and fusion to separation and marginalization. So we have a whole series of um, outcomes. When a subculture has turned into a counterculture, violent clashes can easily occur. In ancient times, there were repeated violent conflicts between the global power, especially Rome, and Jews or Christians. In the next two sections, I will try to comprehend some of the diverse phenomena of early Jewish and Christian apocalypticism within the framework of the proposed cultural model. So this is a kind like our toolbox and we can approach the phenomena um, that are uh, known to us by literature and uh, cultural um, documents. Third part, some peculiarities of early Jewish apocalypticism. In early Jewish literature, there are two main lines of apocalyptic texts from the third century before onward. One line is under the name of Enoch, the other under the name of Daniel. So this is easily to record Enoch and Daniel. Enoch is the patriarch immediately before the flood in biblical history. He is said to have been raptured. So we read the Bible, thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And please note, this is a symbolic number and it relates to the solar calendar. And we, it's a fact, we will hear about that, that the preference of the solar calendar was for some Jewish groups an absolutely essential point in their lifestyle and in their theology as well, whereas the majority of Jews follow the moon calendar. So this number here is highly symbolical. And it's evident that behind this um, uh, sentence here in the first book of Moses, there is much more traditions, uh, much more tradition that we, that is not known to us, but it has also an enormous impact on um, later Jewish groups. We will hear about that. Okay. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him. 
Enoch is so interesting because he was raptured to heaven. Therefore, he becomes the guarantor of hidden knowledge about the heavens and the worlds beyond. So in all these texts, uh, which refer to Enoch, Enoch has a, makes a heavenly journey. He comes back, is mediating his knowledge, and then he is finally raptured. So it's uh, like a two times or even more uh, rapture um, assumption that takes place. There are numerous revelatory texts that want to be written by Enoch. In reality, they were written in early Hellenistic periods. The author authority is Daniel, the wise man from the Babylonian and Persian period. He is the guarantor of a text that reveals the hidden order of history and uh, a text that uh, um, describes how this history is brought to, a, to an end. The Apocalypse of Daniel has later become a part of the Jewish and Christian Bible. Why is this kind of apocalyptic literature created? In a sense, this literature is a double hair. It is hair to the Old Testament prophecy and hair to Israelite wisdom. From prophecy comes its interest in history, which is moving toward an end and a decisive turning point. From wisdom comes the interest in a universal order that governs creation and the human world. In the older scholarship, there was a dispute as to whether apocalypticism was to be derived from prophecy or from wisdom. This alternative is false. It is precisely the convergence of the two that characterizes apocalypticism. The claim of these numerous texts is impressive. They want to express what the prophets and the sages of Israel taught earlier. And this in a completely new format. For this reason, most of these texts are pseudonymous. That is, they claim to have been written by a very great figure of biblical history. But the intention of all these texts is to say in a new way, to make understandable in a new way, what are the old traditions um, of Israel. It is very important to see that the apocalyptic formation concerns only a part of early Judaism. This Judaism, more scholars like to speak of Judaisms, is diverse. And there are besides end time oriented and apocalyptic groups, also quite different branches and groups. Above all, priestly and sapiential circles cluster around the second temple, coming to terms with the existing world and its power structures. And so we have also in Judaism itself a 
enormous tensions between such temple oriented circles and and time oriented apocalyptic groups. Let us now take a look at the earliest apocalyptic writings, which are under the name of Enoch, Enoch and were finally gathered together in a small library, the so-called first book of Enoch. This first Enoch book is completely preserved only in Ethiopian translation and even became part of the canon of the Ethiopian church. But parts of this collection and fragments are also transmitted in Greek and other languages and important parts have been found also in Hebrew or Aramaic in among the Dead Sea Scrolls. First Enoch contains, among other things, a book of the so-called Watcher Angels, an astronomic book, a book of dream visions, and as its latest part, a book of parables. Part of this rich collection are also two apocalypses, one working with animal symbolism, the other unfolding biblical history in a sequence of 10 weeks. Now the material presented by the Enoch writings is very diverse and interesting. It is about angelology, astronomy, meteorology, geography, history, medicine, and other things. What is the significance of this broad encyclopedic knowledge? Our cultural theoretical model offers an answer. Enoch revelations respond to the strong cultural gravitation of Hellenistic knowledge and education. They offer, so to speak, a better alternative to the foreign knowledge that was imported with the Hellenistic rulers and now dominates the world. So it is both, it's in effect the product of Hellenization and it's at the same time uh, an antithesis and a better alternative to that what in the wild world is accepted as cultural knowledge. In other words, Israel's own age, old subcultural tradition the Hebrew writings um, is undergoing a striking upgrade. Specifically, it is the biblical tradition, the tradition of the fathers. Under the name of Enoch, it becomes a superior wisdom, the wisdom of God, in difference to all that kind of wisdom that is uh, produced by human beings. Well, this is then an earthly wisdom. And so often in the view of pious Jews, uh, wisdom that is against God and his will. It is interesting that in an Enoch book, the origin of cultural knowledge is attributed to angels. 
uh, I spoke about the book of watchers and the watcher is a, a designation of a, of a certain kind of angels. They brought the, before the flood, war technology, astrology, magic and luxury to mankind. These angels are considered extremely negative, and so they become fallen angels. They were caught in prisons in the underworld, and they face eternal punishment. So these cultural steps early in human history for the flood is perceived in a negative way. Enoch, on the other hand, represents a positive form of cultural knowledge. His wisdom is based on the old tradition of the fathers and is in accordance with God, with heaven, with the uh, law, the Torah. The other line, more historically oriented, is, as I told before, under the name of Daniel. The canonical book of Daniel shows how the tension between subculture and global culture results in an open conflict. Here, the subculture becomes the counterculture, and the cultural clash erupts. Daniel reflects a cultural crisis in the second century Jerusalem that resulted at last in the Maccabean revolt and liberation from Seleucid domination. In the mythologically colored narrative, Daniel chapter 7, Israel uh, imagined as the son of man is contrasted with the world empires as imagined as four wild and strong animals. Here one sees how a subculture gives a negative interpretation to the imperial global culture. There are many unanswered questions surrounding the Maccabean crisis. In any case, it is of great interest that the cultural confrontation also and above all took place within Israel. A confrontation between Jews who wanted to adapt to a high degree to the Hellenistic culture, the global culture, and those who condemned the adaptation as a betrayal of the tradition of the fathers. A segment of these conservative Jews did not simply stick with the old tradition, but so to give that old tradition an apocalyptic upgrade. So this is not basic what I wanted to uh, outline about early Jewish apocalypticism and we turn now to early Christian apocalypticism. This is the fourth section of our paper. A widespread scholarly consensus has emerged that early Christianity is to be to a considerable extent apocalyptically formatted because of its M, because it is embedded in a Jewish matrix that is itself primarily apocalyptically determined. So Christianity is um, emerging in Jewish, in a Jewish matrix which is in itself mainly apocalyptically oriented. Jesus of Nazareth himself, who acted more as a type 
uh, as a prophet, not as an apocalyptic seer and sage. He was a mistake in the script. So he looks like more a prophet and not as an apocalyptic sage. But Jesus and his proclamation is also to be drawn into this matrix that the kingdom of God he expecting and he's proclaiming is, uh, has a clearly apocalyptic background. And uh, similar, the similar case is with his teacher, John the Baptist. The Apostle Paul, he himself deeply rooted in ancient Judaism, is even more an outstanding representative of an apocalyptic theology. And in general, we can state that early Christians all expected the imminent end of the world and a new world with resurrection of the dead, universal judgment, the appearance of a heavenly city, this is the heavenly Jerusalem, and condemnation of the enemies of God. All this belongs to the standard repertoire of apocalyptic texts and their theologies. And you find it throughout the New Testament and other early Christian writings. Generally seen, the apocalyptic background that characterizes early Christianity is, is most clear in the revelation of John. But before I uh, turn to the revelation of John, I have to insert a small supplement. Yes, which is not here on the in my PowerPoint presentation also I planned it like this. Um, there is one essential feature of early Christian apocalypticism which stands in some contrast to early Jewish apocalypticism, apocalypticism and this is the point that for early Christians the new world of God has already started to appear. Namely in the resurrection of Jesus and in the um, activities of the Holy Spirit. So Easter and Pentecost are both in its way a punctual epiphany of the new world that in its full power and manifestation Christians are still waiting for as um, are doing also their contemporary Jews. But the Christians say it has already started an essential part of these things God is about to bring. It's not simply future as the contemporary Jewish uh, apocalyptic groups expected. So this is a, an important difference that has to be noted at this point. But now, as I told before, we turn now to the revelation of John. Its first word, Apocalypsis, has given its name to all these diverse movements and phenomena. Here we have a nice illustration by Albrecht Dürer showing Christ uh, offering his revelation to John um, 
This is what is described in the first chapter, the introductory chapter of Revelation. The book of Revelation shows all the characteristics of apocalyptic literature. Revelation of hidden knowledge, heavenly scenes, angelic instructions, final historical outlooks, sharp realizations. What distinguishes it from Jewish apocalypses is its renunciation of pseudonymity. John the seer speaks in his own name. Naturally, there's also a debate about this point, but uh, most scholars agree that this John, the author or transmitter of the revelation is the real historical person and it's not a pseudo pseudonymous fiction. If this is correct, then the reason for this is probably to be found in a central Christian experience. Because something entirely new has come into the world. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, there is no longer any need to invoke an old biblical figure. The book of Revelation is a cleverly crafted literary work. It's really sophisticated. It is set on a double stage, heaven and earth as the two stages on which the end of time events take place. Only at the very end of the book, <clears throat> the two stages are brought and fused together. The destruction of the present world leads to the formation of a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, these two stages are then not any longer in a necessary in the way uh, John is unfolding that in his uh, visionary reports. <clears throat> On the lower stage, the catastrophes pile up arranged in three cycles of seven seals, jambones, bowels. On the upper stage in heaven, there are hymnic chants. These choruses interpret the events on earth. So they respond to that, what happens on earth, catastrophes, and they look forward and beyond and try to make a sense out of that. At the same time, these heavenly scenes already give the readers of the apocalypse a foretaste of the good and the life in the heavenly Jerusalem. So this is one part of that, what I said before, that for early Christians, what would come at the end, heaven and all that already started here and now. And the Gospel of John, this has a special uh, meaning then, but this is not our theme now. The revelation of John expects, expects extreme tribulation and persecution of all Christians. Recent research, however, largely agrees that the real situation of Christians in Asia Minor was quite different. There is hardly any evidence of persecution of Christians. There might have been some single cases, there might have been some problems, but it's not a, a worldwide and a, a heavy persecution. But this is the way 
this revelation uh, depicts it. But this is not the historical reality. Moreover, the cities in this Roman province were prosperous and cultural life was flourishing. So John's apocalypse did not come into being in the midst of suffering and blood. It does not make statements about reality, but it is constructing, so to say, a reality, a looking forward to that what would be in near future and what would bring the end so soon. Why then does the text construct such a negative version of the reality at hand in the first place? Our cultural statement, our cultural model again allows us to make some statements. It is obvious that the revelation of John extremely contrasts the relationship between Christian subculture and Roman global culture. culture. Here one can really refer to a counterculture that enters into a massive confrontation with global culture. This can be followed in two directions. First, John has a very radical position towards those Asia Minor Christians who want to adapt to their urban environment. Thus he warns against sacrificial meat eating. He's an exponent of a radical, rigorous and ascetic ethic. He probably specifically targets Christians who have grown up in the Pauline tradition and are open to the environment. So the seven communities, the re revelation is addressed to seven communities in uh, Asia Minor. These are in the tradition of Paul and Paulinism. And part of this Paulinism is uh, to adjust and to adapt to the cultural environment, not without losing identity, but also not by uh, closing up and uh, building heavy walls against uh, the um, urban neighborhood. And you see in the, in the uh, letters to the Corinthians, how this problem, for example, of eating sacrificial meat is a, is a important theme. And Paul does not forbid simply eating sacrificial meat, but he tries to give a, a differentiated answer how to deal with this problem that every person living in an ancient city is just nearly daily or weekly confronted with. There are public uh, events, there are um, certain holy days and so on, festivals in the name of gods and on these days uh, meat is offered throughout the city. And for the Christians is the question, can we join this uh, festival days or do we have to separate completely? This question of adaptation is also in a varied form <clears throat> what the ancient Jews were daily confronted. 
And so we see here the revelation is here, um, <clears throat> offers here a very strict um, position and this can be regarded in some way as an anti-Pauline text within the New Testament. <clears throat> now the, uh, this is so to say at intra um, within the Christian community how to orient to deal with this um, question of cultural adaptation. More important even is the second viewpoint. John presents a mythical contrast between the Roman Empire and Jesus Christ. The city of Rome is contrasted as Babylon with the heavenly Jerusalem. The empire as a terrible beast is contrasted with the Christ, the Lamb Ram. The antithesis between the global world power and the Christ with his followers can hardly be drawn more sharply. <clears throat> John considers the emperor cult symbolized in the second terrible beast of chapter 13 to be particularly dangerous. And you can read the whole, uh, the main visions of the revelation um, is an unfolding a story of confrontation between the beast, the Roman Empire, and Christ and his followers. And it's really in, in a, a sophistic way paralleled. It's a kind of parody that John is here unfolding in his uh, text. In sum, it is obvious that the revelation of John is a document, is a text documenting a heavy resistance to Rome, one of the few voices that did not perish. <clears throat> it's normally so that the nature, the global culture has the power to suppress and even make disappear all the voices that are um, raised against this uh, global power. But there are certain remains of this anti-Roman, of this opposition. This is not you. Revelation of John is among them. Revelation is not underground literature. In literary terms, it is a rather work of art written with great sophistication. But it is just a, as surely a document of a subculture that styles itself as a counterculture to the majority society and to the world power. There are many questions you might, you might uh, bring forward. I have to get to an end as the revelation also is aiming at an end. Today's people understand apocalypticism to be something very negative, something associated with catastrophes and calamities. For ancient Jews and Christians, it was different. Apocalyptic texts and expectations were primarily voices of hope. The plagues and end time turmoil are only the temporary shadow of a great light that will very soon fill the earth. So this is very important to see this difference in uh, between modern 
perceptions of the apocalypse and what ancient Jews and Christians associated with these texts and why they produced and read such texts. I hope that we can also gain something of this confidence and hope as we face the current and future crisis in our world and on our planet. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Follenweider.